Okay, it's 1.45, so I guess I'll start. Go. Anyway, hi, I'm Steve Rosted. Um, I work for Google. Uh, and today I'm going to be talking about something that I decided I was going to need to do uh, a few months ago, back in February. I said, you know, I need to relearn k exec k dump and f trace part because this is something I used to do at Red Hat when I worked at Red Hat, which was over five years ago, six years ago or so. So, what's the best way to relearn something? You write an abstract about what you want to learn and present it. And it gets accepted, and now you're on the hook to learning that. So, I've been relearning this all the time. So, anyway, as my. Um, Oops, did I just turn it off? I turn it on. Anyway, this is, as people know, as they've been to my talks before, smile. There we go, perfect. Um, <clears throat> I'll post that later on Twitter, so. Um, it's my selfie with a, a real camera. That's a real selfie. Anyway, today I'm talking about postmortem, k exec, k dump, and f trace. And back at Kernel Recipes about three weeks ago, there's a guy who says, well, you can't do, you can't use like f trace for postmortem. And I raised my hand and said, excuse me, in two weeks, or I'll be giving a talk at Open Source Summit about you know, postmortem, k exec, k dump, and f trace. So, debugging a panic. This is what this is all about. What happens when the system crashes? It can be difficult. Um, it's, what happens is you have no idea you have sometimes what happened. Uh, limited output from the console. You may not have much output at all, or you may have no output whatsoever. You ever have that GUI and something, suddenly the system just locks up and you don't know why? Um, if you have a serial console, there might be something, a chance, but how many people have serial consoles anymore? My laptop doesn't have a serial console. Yeah, you still have to, yes, yes, yes. Us people, sometimes we really work hard. I try to make sure all my boxes have a serial console. I try some way, even Chromebooks have serial consoles, I want a console if you know how to do it. Yeah, no, they don't. Um, I work for Google. Uh, <laughs> I have that cable, so. <laughs> anyway. Um, What's it called? Uh, yeah, serial is great, and but what for this is now this is for you that doesn't have this access. So, say you have a customer support that there's a system that you don't have access to the machine at all. This is what happened at Red Hat when we had a customer that had these crashes. We needed a way to debug those kernels, and they had they're running proprietary software they did not want to share with us. So we needed to get the data from that machine to bring it over to be able to analyze to figure out how to debug it. Um, it's out in the field, so we don't know what it is. Uh, so they have to send us some information. So this is where k exec k dump comes in. Um, real quick, how many people have heard of k exec k dump? Okay, how, actually, how many people have not heard of k exec k dump? Okay. Here, now, next question. Okay, good. You'll learn something. One person. Um, how many people have used k exec k dump? Okay. How many people? Okay. How many people have gotten working? <laughs> <laughs> the same amount of people, okay. That's, that's one of the things. So, it could create a core dump of the Lynx uh, kernel. So, the core dump could be analyzed by other tools like GDB and what's not. Um, it could send the core dump to other machines uh, at the crash type. So, the crash could happen and you could actually SCP the core dump to another machine from the crash kernel. Uh, the problem is it could be difficult to set up. That's one of the little issues I have with k exec k dump. It's, not, it's gotten much better over the years. Uh, but let's, let me talk about k exec. So k exec acts like um, the exec system call, which if you remember, if everyone knows what the exec system call is, usually do fork and exec. Fork will split you know, the process into a duplicate process with the same address space, same, uh, same program running. Exec changes all the page tables or, so that you see a new world and changes the, the new process to be running something else. So that's how basically everything works inside the kernel, or inside, yeah, Linux, for all the applications you run. With kexec, we do basically the same thing with the kernel. We run a new kernel. We take an old kernel and replace it with a new kernel. So it could be the same kernel, I mean, the same source kernel, but it's actually going to be a, another instance of the same kernel. So this is almost like a fork, kind of. Um, but a lot of times, it'll be a different kernel from the kernel that's running. The old kernel still exists um, on the, in memory that you have access to. It just doesn't execute. You just run the new kernel. Um, some cases, you could use this for fast reboots. So if you have one of these machines that take like 20 minutes to get through the BIOS setup, and there are some that are like that, uh, a lot of times the k exec is used to basically, I need to you know, have a new update for the kernel. You'd have to go from the a new kernel. You don't want to spend the downtime in the BIOS. You do a k exec boot. So actually what it does is it just 
it loads the uh, kernel in memory, and then when it reboots, it just jumps to the new kernel, deletes the old one, and runs. Uh, requires a re relocatable kernel, because you want to be able to put it anywhere inside so it can't be at fixed addresses. Uh, the basic way of this works is you have on your kernel command line, crash kernel, you give it uh, some parameters, and it's going to reserve some space in memory. It'll, on a panic, it jumps to that location and runs and everything's fun. So about this kernel command line, you have crash kernel. Um, the first one is the, well, they actually go with the second one, at 128 meg megabytes. Remember, this is usually for a relocatable kernel. You could tell it where you want, where in memory you want to put it. I believe this is a physical memory layout. You say, okay, at the 128 megabyte location, boom, that's where I'm going to load the uh, kernel or space. The first parameter, by the way, that at is optional. You don't have to tell it. K exec will actually, uh, or the crash kernel, the kernel will actually figure out its own location, but sometimes it doesn't work and sometimes you have to modify it. So this is the way you can modify it. Uh, the 256 meg is how much you want to reserve for it. Uh, this could be tricky to get right. In fact, half the time I spent trying to get this working was I didn't have enough memory or something. But what really happened was I did this. I had a typo. I had to bug on my command line. And I somehow, instead of putting 256 M, I put 256 space M and patch it to debug. <laughs> I, I spent hours trying to figure out why this isn't working until I realized I was giving it 256 bytes of memory to load a kernel. <laughs> so, um, the documentation says, some documentation says 120 megabytes for size. That is incorre incorrect because I had it working until I started playing with the kdump part, which also needs memory, and that didn't work. That was not enough. I needed 256 meg to make this work. So sometimes it, a lot of um, the kegs at kdump is kind of growing, so you have to account for it because um, you'll get more information in, when things go wrong. You'll get some information in var log kdump.log. Uh, but I found out that it's actually quite useless information. I didn't really debug much at all from reading that log. Uh, kdump uses kexec to jump to a new fresh kernel. Um, does not need to be the same kernel. Uh, some people like to have a different kernel, or maybe a sh uh, more a smaller kernel. You can have, especially if you're worried about space, you could make sure the you know turn off all the modules, uh, just loading the right modules for the uh, device that you need. The original kernel is, it's funny, in the documentation when I'm reading all this, I saw boot kernel, first kernel, panicked kernel. These are used interchangeably through the documentation. So when you're reading it, if you see boot kernel, first kernel, panic kernel, that's the kernel that first started and crashed. Uh, the new kernel could be called captured kernel, second kernel, or kdump kernel. Love the documentation for consistency. Um, so it needs kind of a special init RAM disk, although, you can use the old one. You know, there's tools that help you make this. I'll discuss more of that later. Um, but like I said, you could use the normal RAM disk. But it's not really helpful for making a core. But you could play with it, just if you want to learn. Like, that's what I was doing. I'm like, OK, I'm relearning all this. I'm like, let's just use the normal RAM disk, too. Um, it takes several options to create the core dump. So there's several things you could do with the core dump. You could create it on the local file system. That's what I usually do. That's what I'm doing in my examples. I just reserve a spot in the local file system, and uh, that's where I'm going to put all my core dumps. Now, what happens if the file system gets corrupted because it crashed and corrupted the file system? Well, now you're kind of um, in trouble because your, your core dump won't live anywhere. But you can actually hook it to a remote file system, NFS. And you can even use a raw partition that's used reserved only for kdump files. This is all in the documentation. Uh, you can also do, you can set it up so it does a SSH or SCP, so when it creates the core dump, it actually sends it to another machine someplace else. So this is all available in kexec kdump, and, <clears throat> but like I said, I'm not going to go explain it. I actually didn't play with it. I only did enough for here. I got 200 slides, so I didn't have enough information to do everything here. So did you get the picture? No. Um, going back to kdump, where I said you had the memory, the reserved, well, like I said, it loads the kernel, and it loads the ram fs. Uh, so the kdump code actually is the user space side of the code that sits in the RAM, in that RAM FS. It calls a special function or uh, application called make dump file. It's a utility that creates the core dump file, and it reads proc vm core. On the crash kernel, there's a parameter there that creates a, that makes in the proc file system, will create a vm core file. And this is uh, basically a file into the memory of the crashed kernel. Uh, the make dump file runs in the second kernel. So when you jump to the second kernel, it's executed in, I mean, it's not kernel space, but it runs, it's running in, um, 
in the world of the second kernel, and then creates all the, everything you need. The thing is about this make dump file, it needs to have access to the debug symbols of the first kernel. So somehow you need to store the debug information onto the init RAM disk that the make dump file has access to, because otherwise it won't know how to read the VM core file. Uh, you can specify exactly what you want to save from that file, and I'll get a little bit back into that. <clears throat> and like I said, it could send over the network if there's not enough disk space available here. So at the bare minimum, and if you could read that little fine print up there, I'll be posting this. I just finished the slides last night, and even some of the examples have dates from last night. So the, um, I'll be uploading these slides so you could download them and have the links and everything once I get done with this talk. So that's the, so do not take pictures or anything. So on Fedora 36, um, I, I did this on both Fedora and Debian. Uh, for those that use like Ubuntu, Gen2, Suzy, I'm sorry, I didn't have enough time. Anyway, here's the bare minimum. I did the k exec, uh, k -exec function calls uh, on here. Uh, dash p, I believe it means like it's going to be a crash kernel uh, or the boot up after crash or panic. I think that says for panic, do this. And then you pass in the kernel that you want to load. I'm actually using the same kernel that I booted with. And then you can pass in initrd, and this is where I'm using the same initrd that I booted with. But because if I were just to do this, it would almost basically just be a new reboot if I just left it alone like that. I added the append saying that, okay, I want you to boot into the init bash, which is on the init RD. So I ran that, you know, and to, if you want to crash or test all this, you echo C for crash into the proc sys, sys request trigger file, which does a bunch of commands inside the kernel. C is for testing K for this crash kernel because it will actually crash your kernel. So if you want to bring down someone's machine, you got root access and you say, oh, the guy left his terminal. I could go in here, you could echo C and hit enter and you just crash their machine. Don't do that. Um, Boom, crash. So after a boot up, I got to see, hey, give re password. You know, the normal command they usually see. I typed in my password. I said cat command line, um, proc command line, just to see what it had. It added this elf core header app, boom. I think that's the command line that you add to create the proc VM core. So that's where it tells you where to look or something. And just for the heck of it, sure enough, I did ls, and there was proc you know, VM core. So on Debian, on Debian testing, I uh, updated um, on the 18th to the latest and greatest. I did get apt get install kdump tools. That kdump tools is the package on Debian to get the kexec kdump to work. The files that are installed on Debian are you know, the default kdump tools. And then in user shared doc, if you want to read about it, there's a readme.debian. It's very minimal. Debian didn't really put a lot of effort on this. So this is the very minimal, but I got everything working. Uh, if you want to update things, they give you the tool. In that kdump tools, it, create, it creates this utility you could use called kdump config. And you go load. If you say kdump config load, and it reads the information in the uh, default kdump tools and know what to load. And it will create sim links to help uh, do things for you. So you don't have to worry about anything. You just do kdump load, and it will load the kernel um, into the reserve space, and it will load the init RD into the reserve space. Uh, if you want to see how it works, you can say kdump config status. It will show you that if it's operational or not. And you can do a test, which doesn't really test anything. It just says, here's what's going to run when the thing crashes. On Fedora 36, which I updated my machine to be, or my virtual machine to be Fedora 36, it's called kexec tools. I love the consistency here across distros. So like I said, Suzy could call it something else. Gentoo may call it something else. Ubuntu might call it. Uh, Ubuntu is usually based on of, um, Debian, so it probably has the same name as Debian. But anyway, it's DNF uh, install kexec tools. Uh, the files you get is etsykdump.conf. There's a sysconfig kdump. I don't know exactly why they have the two there. But actually, since this is mostly developed by Red Hat, um, and Red Hat supports Fedora, uh, the kexec documentation in there is lots of documentation that's really informative to read. I mean, that's, so when you're doing this, it tells you how to do it for different architectures, PowerPC, ARM, whatever. Um, it's really informative. I was actually really impressed with the documentation that was here. I actually learned a lot. Their tool for consistency with Debian is called kdump control. <laughs> so you do start <laughs> to create the, the, the it reads the, uh, the kdump conf, loads all the stuff. Re oh, by the way, uh, if you modify the kdump conf, it will then rebuild in it 
the kdump init ram disk because the kdump ram disk is built dynamically and if you and it's dependent on what's in the kdump comp file so you could say you actually tell the kdump comp will tell you what you want to do like scp it do a shell do whatever you want um, inside the kdump conf and then it will create the init ram disk if you modify it when you do kdump control start it will say oh kdump.conf was modified let's rebuild the init rd now let's say if it you did something and or something it didn't rebuild it you could say rebuild and it, it will rebuild it regardless whether you modified it or not and then kdump control status will show you whether or not kdump is actually operational or not you want to run this before you ever do any crashes because there's a few times I, I did control c and the machine just rebooted and I went, what what happened i went oh i never started it so triggering k exec kdump as i said you could do echo c but this is not your purpose this is the way you test to make sure you did it properly this is not what you want to be doing in production unless you have that rogue person that finds an open terminal on you um, you could disable that as well I recommend it. Anyway, syscontrol uh, kernel panic oops. You want to enable uh, panic on oops because uh, oops a lot of times is just, you know, you get those bug reports and the nice stack trace. That may not trigger k exec k dump. It might just stop right there. You want to trigger a panic. So you want to say panic on oops, which will trigger that. Well, now you have to be careful because sometimes you'll have an oops like that. Anytime a bug is called, not warning, but bug inside the kernel, it will trigger uh, panic. So if something happens where it could have actually recovered from, there are some cases where bugs are recoverable. Not always. It's best just to reboot the machine anyway. But this will cause the machine to panic and then reboot, uh, do anything. You can also set up an NMI watchdog that will trigger a panic if it detects like a hard lockup. So this make dump file is very interesting, something I'm going to investigate more time in in the future, because it's what creates the core dump file from the, init, uh, from the VM core file after the crash happens. So this, uh, this is run in the init RAM disk after the panic. So you do the reboot into the new kernel. It runs make dump file to create what you need. And then after it's all done, it reboots the machine back to the original kernel. So you could create a normal ELF file, which is readable by GDB. Okay. Or, which is what the default is, and I think it's highly recommended, you do a kdump compress file. It's much smaller than a normal ELF file, and this is where you can add a lot more like stripped down stuff. Like if you're worried, one thing we have to do for this, like at Red Hat and what we're gonna do at Google and everything else, you can't be recording user space data. You have to be very careful about what you could record because for privacy reasons. So you can use this thing to kind of like strip out only the data that you need. So it's much smaller than the ELF version. And then here's the commands you could do. This is by default. I plan on making it strip more than what it does today. But right now, it's everything's page relative. So you could it's five bits it has. And depending on which bit is set, it will exclude things. So if you, do, if you pass in D31, all these are excluded. So <clears throat> then when you reboot into the new kernel, by default, there should be a directory called var crash that has where all these core dumps exist. Um, read the documentation about it. Like I said, you could put it elsewhere. Um, like I mentioned, it could be loaded in other locations. If we're all partitioned, I've already said it, over a network. Uh, but usually, um, uh, you want your, or each crash will get its own directory. So this is, the var crash is where it's going to be done. When a crash happens, it creates a directory that it puts the crash in. On Fedora, it will, the directory name will be followed by the IP address, year, month, day, hour, minute, second. But you know, for consistency, Debian had to do something different. Um, so it creates a year, month, day, hour, minute. With no th so that's what you see when you do an ls of the directories. So the crash files on Fedora, when I ls what's inside there, I see a kexec. I see three files, but this is all by default. Uh, the kexec, um, uh, the kexec dmessage.log is actually the dmessage. If everyone knows what dmessage is, right? Do I have to explain that? Anyone that doesn't know what dmessage is? It's the kernel output that you see. Well, this is a D message of the kexec file, the second kernel, the capture kernel. So you get to see the data or like what happened, all the messages from when the panicked or the, the recovery kernel, or whatever you want to call it, is doing the second one. See the inconsistency? I don't even know what to call it anymore. Second kernel. The VM core is the core, the core dump that you want to look at, just like you have a core dump of a normal GDB process or whatever. Uh, VM, the VM core D message is the D message of the kernel that died. So that's the one that's actually more interesting to me. That's the one you want to look at, because if it has a oops message in there, you'll see it in there. Debian, for consistency, <laughs> has these two files. Um, the D message one is just the D, mes D message of the kernel that died. The dump file is the VM core file. 
And they, for some reason, it also appended the date that has the same name as the directory name, just in case you forgot which directory you're in. Um, so I want to talk about the crash utility. For all those that use KX at KDump, I'm sure, OK. Everyone here knows the, or who here that uses KX at KDump doesn't know crash utility? OK, good. So that's basically the consistency. If you use KX at KDump, you know about the crash utility. It's a GDB uh, wrapper. It's a wrapper around GDB that understands Linux kernel structures. Uh, it was written by David Anderson. I put a question mark on 2003 because I'm not exactly sure when he created it, but the documentation always says copyright 2003, so I'm just assuming that's when it was created. Um, to get it, he has a white paper that he talks about, something that you should read. Um, this is where you get down, download the source code, which you might need. I needed it <laughs> for this demo. Uh, distributed by both Fedora and Debian and other distributions. Um, they both read, I said, the VM core file or you, what, what was it? The dump file for Debian, but you know what I'm talking about. Um, and here's the usage of it. Does obviously crash VM core, and you need a file that has the debug information in it. I said debug info there. It's really, it could be the VM Linux file if you compiled it with debug, config debug info. Um, Debian and um, Fedora, and I'm sure other architecture or other distributions will store the debug information in some other uh, location. So running crash uh, on Fedora, you CD into the place, you run crash the VM core, and this is the path name for where I found it. So it's in user lib debug lib modules uname dash r. That's just because I knew it was this kernel that I'm using. Obviously, you have to put the version number of the kernel that crashed and VM Linux. Debian, actually, this is the first time they're actually match. <laughs> it's in the same location. Thank you. So I'd have to relearn two different long paths. So really, yeah, the, the, the location of the VM Linux debug information was actually in the same location for Fedora, Debian. Thank you very much. So. When I first ran Debian, I did this. I ran crash, dump, and it gave me this nasty error message. <laughs> so I'm like, this is Saturday. I'm like, oh, crap. I have to get this done by my, for, uh, this presentation. I have to fix it. So like I mentioned before, you got to get download the latest crash. So I downloaded the crash utility, and then I um, you know, CD crash. And this second sudo line app get install, I put it there because I didn't do this when I first did it. The first time it compiles, it downloads GDB, like the, like the version it knows. So when you type make, it will download GDB and then build GDB. But what happened was I didn't have these library or this, you know, I didn't have G++ on this virtual, because remember, this was a virtual machine. This is not my desktop work. That was a virtual machine I was doing this on. So it had a limited supply of things that was available. And it crashed, it, the make died. And when I typed, when I downloaded the new stuff and typed make, the make wouldn't work again. The only way I was able to get it again, I deleted the entire directory, re-downloaded it, and started it again. And then I had to do it again for the next thing. Actually, I think once I got Bison on Flex working, the other, the other two, the build continued. So that's why I tell people, make sure you have those packages. <laughs> and then once you start running Crash, it's really nice, since you guys mostly run this before, I and mean, this is not going to be a tutorial. For those that have not, this is really quick. First thing you do is you do PT, a, a BT, backtrace, which gives you the trace of uh, the backtrace of the, the thing that crashed. And if you look here, you'll say, hey, sys requests handler, write down, and it call, well, here's the, actually the system call, it goes backwards all the way up, does the sys, sys request handle crash, panic, crash kernel, K, machine, K exec, boom. That's the backtrace, so you get to see that. You could switch from different tasks. You look at other tasks. You could do a PS to see a nice little PS of all the tasks that were running, what state they were in, lots of nice information. You could do mount to look at everything that was mounted. Um, dev, to look at the devices that were all set, and it shows the FOPs of all the files, and then you can actually look at these, and then you could do for each task, which this is only a cut. It gave, I only had enough room for it on the slide here, but it showed me every single task, the task, th the structure of the task, everything else. Um, it was a lot more. You could type struck something with an address, and it'll give you the structure of that information. So it's really powerful. But this talk is not about crash. So what I'm going to suggest is I'll upload this. This is the AMP page. Look at crash utility. It's extremely useful. There is documentation. I wish there was more documentation, but the more you play with it, the nicer it is. There's a guy in the audience that has another utility that can makes it makes it work for GDB. Where are you? I mean, that's, um, 
Anyway, maybe he's not here. Uh, so, <clears throat> the only problem is it's not very good at knowing how you got there. So, it crashed. Great. This is what happened. We hit a crash. And we look at things and they're like, okay, this is wrong. Something, you can find what's wrong in the kernel with this. Now the question is, how did we get to this state? We don't know. Um, it takes a lot of forensics work and knowledge to do this. It, I mean, once you start doing this long enough, you start seeing patterns, you can figure things out. But that's a big learning curve to do all this. So we all have to become a bunch of, you know, detectives. You know, CSI, crash, GDB, KDump. <laughs> New TV show. So, tangent, off topic. Not quite off topic. One day, there's this question about TraceMD. Okay, who here does not know about TraceMD, Trace Command? Okay, good. It's my utility. It's a front end to ftrace. So, on March 19th, 2010, I get this email from Lai Jiangsheng from Fujitsu. And he's saying, hey, do you have someplace documentation that you could send me on the trace.dat file uh, from, <coughs> um, for your, your trace command output. I said, well, if you have the man pages installed, you just do man trace command dot dat. And it gives you all the, for yes, I'm a documentation freak. I like, to write, I like to document things. So I documented the format and put it into a man page. <laughs> so, so that's all I said. And then he just said, thank you, and disappeared. disappeared. May 20th, two months later, I get CC'd on this patch to the crash utility from Lai Jiangsheng. Patch title is, Crash trace command, generate trace.dat file from core file. I went, I can't say what I said. <laughs> I went, Holy, <laughs> wow. I'm glad for that man page. So, the crash trace extension. So, for the longest time, in fact, it was funny part, it, was, it kind of freaked me out. It was in uh, the get tree of the crash utility, and then when I went to go look for it, I couldn't find it. And it freaked me out. I'm like, what? Did they get rid of it? Was it, was it unmaintained? What's the problem? And they said, no, they actually moved it in April of last year to uh, its own crash utility repository because I guess they were doing so much updates and such like that that they said, look, we're, just, we're not going to bother the maintainer of crash. We're just going to pull it out and do it on our own. So it's here, the GitHub, Fujitsu, crash trace is the repository. I've actually submitted patches and fixed some of the things there. It's actually kind of fun learning how to walk through the kernel from a crash core dump. Um, I was going to actually talk about that, but I ran out of time. Um, unfortunately, Debian hasn't caught up yet. Uh, there's no package. So if you download the crash utility, crash tools, or whatever it's called, kdump tools that Debian calls it, you will not have the trace utility. You actually have to download and build it from uh, scratch, or build the crash utility from scratch, and then you have to build this from scratch as well. It doesn't matter because, like I said, I tried running the the k exec k dump from Debian and it didn't work anyway. <laughs> so I had to download and do it myself. So, but on Fedora, they have uh, the package utility called crash trace command. So you can't just download crash, you have to download the package called trash trace, uh, crash trace command. Wow, say that 10 times fast. So, so it reads the ftrace ring buffers as well as the KL sims and the event format files and puts everything that the trace metadata needs and builds a trace value file for you. So then you could just run trace command on it. So using the trace extension is so this is what we do. So I, obviously I did this on Fedora because Fedora had all the information. So I said, you know what? I did it on Debian too, but I'm just talking about Fedora now. So I do the start. I do the status. I'm like, OK, let's run function tracer. And then C proc, uh, proc sys request trigger crash. No, it really did crash. I mean, really, kexec did not come up. It triple faulted and rebooted. <laughs> this was Sunday. <laughs> I was like, oh, crap. Um, what happened? So one of my tools, this is what I'm like, great. I could talk about one of my tools that very few people know about exists inside the kernel. So function tracing traces almost all kernel functions. And every so often, it traces something it shouldn't. And when that happens, uh, bad things happen. For example, some functions are called when memory is shut, just disappears. So basically, it's just executing 
special code where the actual data of the kernel is disappearing, or especially like in shutdown, turning off CPUs, uh, suspend and resume. They have locations that do weird things that you can't write to memory, or memory turns into you know read only. Like they might just say, okay, memory's all read only now. So when we try to do a trace of something, we try to write to something, we take a fault. Then we go into the fault handler, and the fault handler tries to write something, it can't. So it faults. And then it goes into the fault handler and says, uh oh, we did this three times, we see a pattern, just reboot the machine. So these taking on CPU, shutdown path, I already said this. So if one of these functions is trace, writes to memory that's not available, we get the fault and reboot. So how do we find that function? So here's the thing. The problem is a function here. So we bisect. You know, we have, there's actually inside the Linux kernel repository, inside scripts tracing, there's a script called ftrace bisect.sh. And the way you do it is, first thing you do is you copy it from there to put it someplace else. Unless you want to run it from the repo, sometimes I usually like to keep it. So it's available. I copy it into a user local bin so I can execute it. Um, then what you do is you cat the available filter functions, which is all the functions that ftrace will trace, into a, uh, this thing called full file. So I just call it to full file. And then I run ftrace bisect, so you pass in all the functions you want to trace, so that's going to be tested. And then you say a test file, which is a file that you want to do your test on, and a non-test file, which will put all the functions that is not being tested into the test file. So basically it splits the full file in half, puts half of it in the first file, and half of it, uh, the rest of it in the second file. And then what you do is you cat trace file to the set ftrace filter, which only enables the function. So when you enable function tracing, it will only uh, trace the functions that are in this file. So I'm doing test the file. Don't do this. <laughs> Great, I just wasted all this time just to tell you not to do something. Um, why? Well, there's 50,000 files or functions in that file. And when you, if I do this, which is I do time, I just timed head. I only passed in a thousand of those functions. Remember, there's fifty thousand functions. So I did the top thousand into of the available filter functions into set ftrace filter, and it took almost a minute to complete. Why? Well, it requires thousands of functions to be filtered in set ftrace. This could take several minutes because it does an O n squared algorithm with k all sims, because you're passing in a name. Everything in ftrace is addresses. It doesn't know anything about names. So to all addresses, that's a convert to k all sims. Now, if you're going to do a k all sims, and we're passing a k all sims, we have to now match, to match a name to 50,000 functions, we actually have to search all 50,000 functions. And anything that matches, it's going to walk through that all that time. So if you're passing in 25,000, it's 25,000 times 50,000. X, K all sim lookups. So it takes a long time. So you're taking, it takes, could be like five, 10 minutes or more, 15 minutes to execute half of that. And I got tired of that. So in 2019, because I, you know, someone said, hey, this config breaks on shutdown or something or on CPU hot plug. And I went and tested it. And sure enough, yeah, something broke. And I was like, I don't have time to do this. So I modified the kernel to allow set ftrace filter function to do something different. If you do the index of the available filter functions into the set ftrace filter, it will just go to that index and enable it. Because the available filter functions is just a direct mapping one to one in the exact order of, sorry. So the direct mapping of the, um, <clears throat> Uh, what's it called, how the layout in the index inside the kernel is the same as the layout in the available filter functions. So when you say index here, you just say that it's easy, you could just easily find that function and enable it. So let's say we did, we, I want the 100th file. So I did head dash 100 of available filter functions, tail minus one. So it gives me this arc perf update user page, which is the 100th entry into the available filter functions. I echo the 100 into set ftrace filter and boom, it does arc, it gives me exactly that function that I saw. So let's go back to the original thing of, remember I did the first thousand and it took 50 seconds? Well, I'm gonna copy the set ftrace filter into a temp directory or into the temp directory called a file called A. I did the second one, look how fast. A thousand, I did seek a thousand, which is just gives you one through a thousand right there. It took real time uh, 93 milliseconds and both user and system time was like zero. 
So it's an 0, 01 operation, extremely fast. So let's copy that into B and do a diff to see if it's, everything's OK. Well, they weren't the same. Anyone can guess why they weren't the same? Static functions. All these are multiple instances within the file. So because when you pass a name, it goes and matches everything that matches that name. So if you have something like type show, there's a lot of type show functions in the kernel in lots of various areas. They're static, located there. So it will enable all them. So that's why it's, it, it's different. Where here's something else that's different. When by echoing the number, you can actually distinguish which type show you want. So ideally, you just do that. And that's why every, I checked out every one of these things had a duplicate within the first thousand um, functions. So I'm like, OK, still, you, I don't care. I want to know which function is crashing. I really want to know which function it is. That's why I don't care about this. So going back to it, so instead of doing this cat, uh, the test file, um, so instead of doing the cat or, or, the, or the whole thing, it's a full file, what I do instead is I do a WC of the line count. Give me how many functions are there. There's 52,340 functions in the available filter functions. So I do seek you know, 54 or 52,340 into full file, and then I do the bisect, same thing, because now I'm just, this full file is just a list of numbers, and that's all I care about. And then I make the whole thing full file, and it splits it half and half. I do the echo test, you know, and then I go through. If I crash, if it, if it locks up or does a reboot or does something bad, I go and I say, okay, copy the test file that just happened to full file point one. So now I'm going to do the second stage of the bisect. By the way, always put the point 0.1, point 0.2. And uh, when you run the second time, I always do the point 0.1. That way, I, sometimes you'll screw up and you want to go back and you want to find out where you were. If you don't do this and just keep, you know, just rename it to full file, which I used to do, I found out that I screwed up and I had to restart the process all over again. So that wasn't fun. So I always put in levels so if I screw up, I could kind of figure out where I screwed up. If it doesn't lock up, always test a non-test file first. That means that one of the functions, if it doesn't lock up, the non-test side should be the problem, so I would test that before you go further. This is how I messed up. I didn't test the other side, and I somehow screwed up. Anyway, then you copy the next test to the file one, and you go on, wash, rinse, repeat. Finally, I got down after 16 iterations, I got and I found that there's, it, I put in this, and it reports if there's only one function there, it will tell you, hey, there's only one function left. That must be the bad one. And that was number 749. So I echoed 749 into the set ftrace filter, and I did a cat of set ftrace filter, and it said H3 is isolated, isolation supported. Hmm, OK. So what I did was I, start, I started the k-dump, got it ready, and then I ran the function tracer. Uh, trace command with the dash n option means don't trace this function. So I put dash n, uh, H3 is isolated, uh, isolation supported, and then I'm like, OK, a cat to make sure it really was in the set ftrace, no trace file. I want to make sure before I did the command. Ran the C, crash, it worked. So that was the actual problem. So I was like, oh, I was going to go and say, OK, I'll submit a patch, make that no trace. Well, when I booted the, I, tried, I tested this on the latest kernel, the 5.19 RC2, it worked fine. So it's, this is with the 5.17 kernel had this issue. But this is something you want to know. I, I did this because it might be. So crash VM core there. And then I did the extend. By the way, that's how you load the module. So extend trace.so. You sometimes, if you, if you build it yourself, you have to put the full path in to get to it. But to add the extension is to crash. You do extend trace.so. It says it's loaded. And then if you do help trace, it gives you all this information. The only one I cared about for this talk happened to be this bottom one, the trace dump dash t, which says output file. So it says it's going to dump the ring buffers and all the metadata, and it'll create the trace.dat file for you. So that's the one I ran. I just ran trace, dump dash t, and there's a temp trace.dat, exit, and then trace command report, and boom. And right there is the machine exec that you saw that it did the exec stuff. So you got to see, and then there's actually an NMI handler triggered shortly afterwards, too, before the whole thing rebooted. I've done this several times. This, the first time, I'm like, OK, I'm going to do the uh, cut and paste version of it was the time I had an NMI handler. That doesn't usually happen. I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. So I was like, let's try doing a little bit more information. Let's add scheduler events and interrupt events, make sure I turn off that uh, HV is isolated, supported, and then did the whole crash, did the whole thing, um, <clears throat> did the tr uh, brought up the crash, the extend trace.so, did the trace dump to the file, and I exited, and I ran kernel shark. Boom. 
There's the exact core dump from the crash from with a kernel dump or a kernel shark output. This is just saying that, hey, you could do this. So let's try demoing. I said I want to demo. Let's, where are we here? Oh, it stopped? Ah, I can't do, wait, it's not, oh, come on. I can do, okay, 30 seconds. Oh, come on. Let's do, uh, well, then I want to do the Debian one because uh, this one has the, I can't remember which uh, file, it was uh, trace command start dash E. Oh, I can just do sked, just sked, sked events. Okay, that's it, boom. Um, K dump, control start. Status, okay, echo, C, uh, proc, uh, sys request trigger, and one of these, where is it? Oh, there it is. That's my Debian one. I'm hoping it worked. So it's rebooting back. Look at my guy. I know, I know, I know, I know. This is, uh, and then from here, SSH, CD, VAR, uh, crash. Uh, what's today's date? Uh, today's the 22nd. Yep, it's the only time of there. LS, uh, crash, VM, wait, I see it do a crash, VM core there, entry extend trace.so hurry up hurry up hurry up hurry up hurry up hurry up <laughs> it needs to be as fast as me trace d um, wait right they say trace ah. what was that camera it was trace that d dash t temp trace that that Don't push me. <laughs> uh, exit, uh, kernel shark. Come on, kernel. Oh, I don't have kernel shark on this one. Wait, yeah, I have to, I have to copy it. So trace command, report. What? Well, oh, but anyway, there it is. Bump. Wait, that's, yes, that's all sketch switch. That's all the sketch events. So there it is. It worked. <laughs> That was 200 slides. <laughs> okay. Thank you.